Welcome to the Official Spotlight Podcast. My name is Simon Lipskin and thank you very much for listening. Delighted today to say that my guest is Rebecca Lonsdale. Rebecca is the CPO at BP Castrol, which is the global lubricant business with customers in over 140 countries. Rebecca has been in that role since February 2021. And prior to that, she's held senior procurement roles in a number of businesses, including businesses like Britvic and Nissan. So Rebecca, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation today. Here we are, you're a very senior lady working in a very senior procurement role in a big global business. Was that always the plan? First of all, it's lovely to be here today. And I guess in short chances, yes, it was, but not quite in the journey that I've taken. So I have always been very career driven and very focused. That's not a secret. And I suspect 90 something percent of the procurement world did not as a child dream of being a buyer that wasn't my childhood ambition not your thing. Yeah. but that said my first job was in procurement and I haven't strayed where was that first job Rebecca how did it all start so it started with Nissan I did a degree in management systems and German which is quite a mathematics based sort of management um, analytics degree very male dominated environment on my course actually but for reasons that I even now can't explain I was obsessed with getting an automotive graduate training program I wanted graduate training because I thought it would give me a really good broad structure because I knew I wanted to be in a commercial business environment but wasn't quite sure which bit and yeah. I thought grad training would be a good way to get that sort of grounding and I wanted automotive so so I applied, did the milk rounds and was very fortunate to be offered two jobs, actually, well, three, but two specifically I was interested in, one with Peugeot in marketing. And then I went on to my interview at Nissan. And I remember really clearly sitting in the, um, the entrance to Nissan in Sunderland and it was for a procurement role. So in Nissan, when you fill out the application form at the time, you had a choice of, I think it was purchasing, as it was called then, HR yeah. or engineering. I was like, the only thing I can sort of do is purchasing. So I ticked that box, started being interviewed for it and realised actually this was my hidden calling I didn't know anything about. So I turned down the job with Peugeot. And the fact that it was Peugeot wasn't the point. It was a marketing role from the foyer of Nissan before I'd even been offered the job because I was so sure that A, I liked wow. Nissan and B, I wanted procurement. and I was just sold on it. I sharpened my focus for the interview, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> And look, the rest is history. So I started with Nissan in procurement. From there, I then worked in France when Renault bought a third of Nissan. I was I was lucky enough to go to France to be part of the, the team setting up the new alliance business in France. I then went to work for Renault. From there, I moved across to Britvic, where, and I'd gone then from a, two very big global automotive companies to a what felt like a much smaller business in, in Britvic, right. again in procurement. And that's when I made the switch from direct to indirect. And I was there with Britvic. And, and actually, Britvic was an interesting pun in my life because it grew as I grew. So I was there for 15 years, but I joined as a category manager for my best description and left heading up their procurement functions that was quite a nice organic growth and then from there I've now I'm now with Castrol as the CPO which is a really neat blend of FMCG because Castrol is more FMCG than we realize and the automotive piece all coming back together in one piece so that's a phenomenal career journey as we said from the start right through to the heights of our industry in in a huge global business I'm interested maybe to start with impactful individuals leaders that you've worked with during that time for example Okay, so let's start. Maybe if I think about some of the key influences, and the uh, I start with my early career. So this time I was, I mean, you can imagine it. Twenty one, age isn't the point, but I was young, I was enthusiastic, and I wanted to absorb it all and suck it all up. I was, we were living in Newcastle. I'd never been that far north before. It was all quite a big adventure. They paid us well, relatively speaking, and they basically had us working hard. But I was just ready to absorb everything. And I, I again, I realised at the time actually it was quite an influential and. We would have called him a manager, but leader by today's terminology. There's a guy called Darren now, who actually I now know does a bit of work with Vicio. So I'm going to name check him, actually. Yeah, Um, friend of the podcast, Rebecca. So for listeners, there's an interview with Darren people can pick up. Go back and listen to the Darren one. But he was a big, it was an influence for me. And it's one of those situations where he's gave me some advice, which I'll share in a moment. But he's probably even forgotten he gave it to me. But it's something that stayed with me like 20 plus years later. So I was keen to be the first one off the grad programme, the first one to be promoted. And I was there going to save the world from the expensive car parts. And I said to him down and said to me, because I know you want to get this promotion back. I said, yeah, yes, I'll tell you what it is you need to do. So I turned up with a pad and a paper and I sat down and I was going to t- absorb all, suck all this information out of him. And he just said, if you want to be the boss, be the boss. And then walked off. <laughs> but, um, and then obviously reflection is basically his point was it's about your behaviors and if you behave in a way that is in a leadership way it becomes more apparent and obvious to those around you and you then become the natural choice that's what he was really telling me yeah. in that sort of unique scouse way that was very direct so the other thing Darren has or ha- had I'm sure he still does is an incredibly authentic leadership style and that was my first introduction on reflection to someone who led with real authenticity and integrity so yeah. he was there to do the best thing which was 
normally the right thing as well. He was able to navigate the, the true right course, if you like, which might not necessarily have been entirely complicit with the, the corporate protocol at the time as well. And that's, I think, quite an important and quite a big influence on someone very early in their career, actually. So I'd say okay. that was one of my early influences there. The next leader that influenced me, it's actually the gentleman, actually, was my leader when I was at Renault. So when I moved across to Renault, I had gone from working in this Sanson environment I knew and trusted into Renault. And Renault, same industry, but structurally so fundamentally different the way in which it operates so okay. Nissan's philosophy was always steeped in having the right quality having the right process we were really driven to understand cost breakdowns and understanding from a procurement point of view it's an incredibly thorough environment in which to learn and I still look at things now and it can instantly do a cost breakdown on something that was how right. <laughs> It wasn't the way we operated. Renault, they were cost focused, but it had a slightly different lens to it. It was more, it was more brand focused. And if you go back to the early noughties, the, the Renaults were quite, they were quite innovative vehicles on the road. The, the company behaved differently as well. So I was in a different culture. I would be landed in the middle of France, speaking with my GCSE French, able to order croissants and an ensuite room, but not much more. And was then thrown in this environment, working with a, a gentleman called Olivier Gantron. And he had basically embraced the fact that he hadn't learned French yet. He conducted a lot of the meetings in English but then he, when we, he and I spoke we spoke in French he gave me some support with an assistant who was French so I, he gave me the opportunity to learn the language quickly in a way that was quite safe so he gave me a protected environment other thing he did is he gave me the space to set me free and that is something which as a leader is quite a brave thing to do so he basically gave me the space and the freedom to operate so he, he wasn't suffocating in his style so he said this is what you need to do come ask me if you if you need some support and that is actually again a it's not a hands-off but it's gave me a sense of how freedom sort of like freedom in a framework can be incredibly empowering if you're a team member and that's what he did to me and he gave me that, that freedom to understand that I had the safety net to ask which yeah. he, and that, that safety that comfort he provided through the support he gave me with my with the language that's why I, knew, I trusted him but he also meant that I was able to have the freedom to do what I wanted to do which in the procurement world is actually incredibly empowering because you can set up a different approach different relationships I could bring some of my Nissan influences into the, into the Renault environment the Renault is quite a traditional company and I was desperate again to progress up the ladder I had set myself some career goals which is actually something I probably want to talk about in terms of did I do the right thing and I don't know in terms of the career goals I was going to be a ex-manager by the time I was 30 yeah. and then when I made it I was going to be a CPO by the time I was 40 and so I set this goal of being a certain a certain level by 30 and he said to me we, this environment isn't going to do that for you so it's not that you can't but it, it's there's too many hurdles to jump so he said actually I give you if you want to look for something else and I'll give you the freedom to go I'm not going to force you to stay and that was a really important lesson again quite early in my career that I was have been given the freedom or the permission to do something different and that opened up my Britvic career right. and that's the point at which I joined Britvic so I left France and came, came to Britvic now I did get that manager level by the time I was 29 and I was delighted but it's also as I look now I then said my next goal was to be CPO by 40 I didn't make it I was 42 yeah. I guess some of the influences we set ourselves are not always that healthy because actually what is a number it's about experience it's about opportunities it's about other things that go on and I think my reflection although I was very successful in career terms and opportunities partly right place right time in my 20s my 30s was when I married I had two children and actually you can't have that speed of a transition and ambition actually has to shift because and that was one thing I don't think I had realized as a 29 year old setting my age 40 ambition but it's not that life gets in the way but life gives you opportunities that means you want to do things differently and actually there were two occasions in my life when I decided that consolidating and doing what I do well is actually okay yeah and it, you don't always have to push and that was a really important life lesson actually I'd love to unpick that a little bit Rebecca because talking to you it, there's a wonderful sense of kind of energy and, and drive and ambition when I talk to you about your career and that it seems so overwhelming positive but equally as you say I'm sure that puts pressures on on yourself as an individual as, as have done I'd love to unpick that perhaps particularly I guess at the point as you say in your 30s where other elements of your life particularly family may have come into that how was that experience a, a highly driven very successful individual meeting those other challenges which are no longer work challenges I think that's a really interesting point to reflect on actually so my son is now 12 to put it in context and I have a daughter who's nine. And at the time when I was beginning to start thinking about families, I was convinced that I needed to be the next level up, the next run up, so I could secure that level of seniority before I started a family. 
I don't regret that because it was the right decision for me at the time, but it's not advice I'd give anybody else. And what I've learned is there's no right time, there just stops being a wrong time. And that not yeah. wrong time is personal to the individuals, right? Yeah. Everybody's parenthood journey is different. We were lucky, we were able to have children, but other people don't. People, children come in, you become parents and families in lots and lots of different ways. Yeah. Some of it you can't plan for and mitigate for. So the fact that our journey was actually quite easy was lucky, but it could have easily just been just as hard. And I'd made no provision for that. I just decided that I had to be at a certain level and then I'd be senior enough to have a child. That was wrong. The time is when you're ready for it. That's the first advice. And that's, again, something if I think about some of the, the influences that Darren gave me, that Olivier had given me. And I say I can talk about the, one of my, my boss at Britvic actually as well. Each of them have given me a piece that's important. And the bit I've taught myself is when it comes to the parenthood journey, that especially as a female, taking six months or nine months or 12 months out of the business makes virtually no difference to the business. It makes hundred a thousand percent impact on you as an individual and you as a parent as well that's the equation I hadn't understood so when I had my son I went back straight after six months and I was convinced that the business had transformed radically in those six months while I was busy <laughs> flailing around not having a clue what I was doing and I went back in our six months my choice and decided that the best way to cope was pretend I didn't have a child so I got to work early I, I left late I was not going to be the person that said I've got to leave to do the school run we wouldn't fought my husband and I both worked we could employ a nanny we were very lucky and I decided that the best way was pretend that nothing had changed yeah. and that actually was a mistake because something had changed you know yes. I had a child I was a mother we were a, a family and that was really important and I I regret my belief that I had to be this sort of like inhuman almost sort of like machine yeah. and I regret it for two reasons actually one is the message it sent other women in my team was wrong I'd come in and said I've had a child but look I'm unchanged because I wasn't actually I wasn't I actually went back too early as I now realize I wasn't physically ready okay. to, to work actually that's the one thing I wasn't ready for and secondly when there's someone else that's more important the most important thing in the world to do which is your new child you can't ignore their existence you have to have that, that human factor so I my regret is I gave the wrong initially the wrong the wrong role model actually number one yeah number two I wasn't being kind to me I wasn't actually accepting the fact that something big had happened and that was yeah. important to me so that, that's my regret when you look back on that and I think it's I think it's a really common perspective and it's fantastic to hear you you talk about it because I think it's super helpful for other people how much of that do you think came from a, a positive place as in you wanted to get back because you're great at your job and you were making a difference how much of it was from a negative place of you, you were just worried that you know you would fall behind or a bit of both actually so the first talk about the positive the positive was I was good at my I'm still good at my job actually but I was good at my <laughs> sorry job. yes I, was, I knew what I was doing and I know I was leading a team of procurement I was in control of it and we were in a good place at that stage we'd had quite a big transformation in what we were doing in procurement and we were there was a clear plan there was it was exciting and I was enjoying what I was doing so that's the positive and I wanted to get back to yeah that. the negative is when you have a child for the first time and certainly for me you don't know what you're doing <laughs> so I was flailing around at home a little bit broken physically obviously knackered and just I sort of craved doing something that I knew what I was doing because the cliche you don't get a manual but I didn't know what I was doing with it with yeah. and so I'd gone from knowing everything having structure and order to having no structure and no order and so was I trying to leave that to, to go back to the structure a little bit the other bit the negative point was I was really convinced wrongly I should point out but I the, the reality but it was my reality was I was going to go back and become insignificant because something else you know the, the world would have, have moved on and that Rebecca shaped hole was no longer going to be there in the organization and that become a, a reality to me wrongly actually yeah. I now no but I didn't at the time so it was part positive getting back to something I loved and was good at but there was a negative driver which was if I don't go back I'm not going to be relevant I'm not going to be good enough I'm not going to fit back back in and the world will have moved on there was a definite driver in that space as well which turned out not to be true but it was very real for me in those, very in those real to you. yeah how has that experience impacted how you lead now you're you leading loads of people in a huge organization how's that impacted your leadership it has had quite it's had a, it has had a profound effect on me actually so took me a while to realize this so when I had my daughter I, I did take a bit more time off I was and that was the point at which when I came back having her I realized that was my consolidation time so that's those are not that and I learned so I learned a little bit of that but in terms of with me anyone that has worked with me or for me will know that the mantra is family comes first and I mean that and that's not just kids it's parents we're now of a generation or an age where some of us I've got people colleagues who their children are grown up but they're now looking caring for their parents as well so you've got this it's about family it's not just about children it's a family so family will always come first and I will never ever let any 
anybody do anything that compromises their commitment to their family. So that's, and it's not that I didn't believe that before, but I perhaps wasn't as vocal about it. So it's absolutely yeah. front and centre of the philosophy in terms of my leadership style. So that's the first thing. And secondly, to any women that are, or I say women, it is about people in my team, but I, I tend to focus on the women because they're normally the ones having the children. You you have your children, you have that time and you, you, you just decide that only time that's right is you. It's a deeply personal decision. And the world, the environment, the work around you, we can make that work. Never, ever let a work commitment or a work environment get in the way of your of the plans to, to change your family environment. And I, I believe that really strongly. And the third thing is, I am proud of being a working mother as well, which is when I first came back after having my son wasn't, I almost felt like I was, I was almost a bit embarrassed about it. Okay. And now I'm, I'm, I am proud of the, of, of the fact that they are part of what I do. And don't get me wrong, this isn't about the parental guilt. Of course it's there. And the other thing is I never, I have not, and I'm deeply proud of this actually, I haven't missed a nativity, a school assembly, but I've made sure that I've fitted that in around my day. So nativities happen once a year, right? School assemblies happen once a term. We're not, I'm not claiming any prop, but my point is I will make sure that I know which Friday in which month I've got to be there at the school to be able. So I will make sure that those are there and my, you know, the parents even aren't missed either. So, and again, my team will do that as well. So I lead with that to my team. No, I can't do that. I'm taking my, putting my daughter to do ballet or I'm taking my son to whatever. And that's something I really bake into my day. And again, I encourage my team to do the same. So. Yeah, presumably, Recky, you, you see that as a as a positive for the business as well. It, it creates stronger teams. It creates better dynamics. It's not a trade off in that sense. No, it's not. And look, everyone has different drivers, right? For me, trust will always be in my top three. Okay. And that trust is a multifaceted concept. So it's like that I trust my team, that I'm trusted by my boss. This whole different elements of this, this web, if you like, or this support network of trust is really important. So yes, it does benefit the business because it means I'm entering into a relationship of trust with my business, like Olivier did. He trusted me to, to give me that freedom. In the same way that if I look back at the, the first boss I had at Britvic, actually, another name check, a guy called Doug Boudry. He's now at British Sugar, actually. He he took a chance on me. So he took a chance on me. He brought me in from an automotive environment into an FMCG Britvic environment, yep. by indirects, right? So that whole trust bit, Doug took a chance on me. And that trust element is what I'm talking about with my team. So I trust them to do the job. We're there to do a, to do a job, not to work between X time and Y time broadly. Now, there are jobs that fit into a certain time scale. Of course, there are, but not generally in the procurement office based world, let's call it that. So it does, because what the company gets is trust and they get, if I take, I will give or if I give, I'll take. And that's that whole philosophy. Do I give more than I take? Of course I do. And I think most people do as well. But it's not as mercenary as that. I think what we get is that element that people go the extra mile. And that sounds really trite. I don't mean it to. But I do think it's all about, to me, yeah. and the way I operate is about trust. And it's that trust that I give to individuals. And I value being given to me as well. It's really important. So, and it becomes a, a virtuous circle, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. So. Rebecca, as I said, the extraordinarily positive drive and energy you've clearly had throughout your career. How are you directing that now, right? You've, you're in this very big role in this very big organisation, but I assume that energy and that drive hasn't disappeared. How are you directing that for your No, career? it hasn't. The job I now have, CPO that's at Castrol, it's been a really interesting journey. It's just over three years. But those of you that have been in oil and gas <laughs> will recognise this. But I joined in February 2021, which was the beginning of a massive, like unprecedented supply shortage for a number of different reasons it was covid it was a there was a big freeze in texas then a year later that obviously we had the uh, geopolitical challenges of the, of the ukraine war as well so i was in an environment where i had come in with all these grand plans of things i was going to do to you know, reset the strategy and actually what we had was nearly two years of survival i'd gone into survival mode so what i had to do was make sure that we could supply our factories we could, we could keep the supply chain running we, could, we were literally gone from the, the transformational any procurement strategy wasn't wasn't an agenda it was about it was pure survival for the better part of two years I had to completely reset my approach to everything I was wanting to do. Have I been super positive and highly energetic throughout that entire court journey? Of course I have in the States when it was really <laughs> hard, really hard. And especially I joined in the middle of lockdown. So I didn't meet anybody. I didn't meet a single member of my team for seven months, right? Even right. the people that hired me, right? So yeah. did I stay upbeat and super positive every single day? No, I didn't. It was, it was it's hard right and this bit about trust it's, it's far harder oddly enough to build trust in a two-dimensional or one-dimensional world if you like with a screen and a speaker right so all the stuff that I rely on from a trust to dependency the all those those extra senses have gone I didn't know how my team took coffee there's all these things yes, <laughs> that yes. you rely on but what I did see was what I walked into was a team that knew what they were doing so I had confidence and faith in the team and there was a real sense of drive of fixing that that sense of wanting to solve was there so it wasn't I'm not the team was fully functional 
and functioning. So what we're now doing is we're now in a thriving environment and we'll then look at how we can transform later on. So it's been a journey that was actually, it wasn't delayed, it just wasn't what I was, nobody could have predicted what we would have all, it's not just me, what we all couldn't do then. But staying positive, it's partly the way that I'm made, but partly it's about having a good the faith and the belief in the team around you as well and being able to see that the that, that we've got this, this ways through and to solve and I'm quite solution orientated. So being able to how we how can we fix something? If I look back, I have learned so much in the last three years, but I didn't realise I was learning it at the time. So it's that constant learnings and having that time to reflect. And that is a luxury, actually. Yeah. Rebecca, I'm conscious of time, so this should probably be my last question, but fascinating and real privilege to talk to someone like you at this point in your career and for you to be so open with your reflections on things. I'm just thinking if there's someone listening to this podcast on their iPhone, sat in the reception of a business that they're about to kind of go and apply for a job, like looking at procurement, you think that's a positive thing? Would you be excited for them when you you look forward for the, the future, Rebecca? Is this, is this the place to be? As a, it is actually, and there's probably two things I'd say. One, to anybody that's unsure, trust your instincts. If it yeah. feels right, it is. Yeah. I am a massive fan of that. If in doubt, go without. Right, trust your instincts. If you're not sure, <laughs> abort. The first thing. The second thing is, it's the bigger stuff. If it feels right, it probably is. Those first bit of instinct is so important, and we ignore it. If we don't pause to acknowledge the first thing we feel, we ignore it. So that's the first thing I'd say from a behavioural point of view. In yeah. terms of procurement. Yes, procurement is where it's at. I'm biased, of course I am, right? I've been here more than 20 years, but it has changed and evolved in that time as well. And yes, I've changed industries, but I haven't re- I haven't changed career. I've, I've been on this literally an upward trajectory within within, um, within procurement. And it is still the business. It'll be the area of the business that can impact the bottom line. It's still the one that's going to be at you. Every day, what we do will have an impact to our com- my business, my company's profitability or growth. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's exciting. And whether it's whether you're looking at profitability, whether you're looking at growth, debt, whatever it is, the point is we are making a difference, and that's exciting. Right, number one. Number two, we are close to being able to understand the essence of how the business operates, and being able to to have the to be able to refine something and do something and have an impact on that is really important. The other thing is, and this is misunderstood, I think, or misunder- misrepresented, is the importance of the relationships as well. People do business with people; they don't do business with businesses. And the fact that we are as procurement often the face of the business we're dealing with, we become yeah. Yeah. that interface point to be able to do business with people as well and that's a really exciting place to be so I'm absolutely biased unapologetically but I think procurement is it's as exciting now as it was 20 plus years ago my, my journey within it is different and yes what I'm doing is, is different but I still get involved in negotiations there's still no no better you know for me than planning and preparing and watching a negotiation unfold I still enjoy that thoroughly recommend anybody that's thinking about a career because we're always going to need stuff (laughs) (laughs) yes but you know I I, I see it as somewhere that and there's always something always something can be done differently or better and to be part of that I think is quite exciting well very exciting actually Rebecca thank you so much fascinating real privilege to talk to someone like yourself at this point in your career and thank you for being so open about sharing your thoughts as you look you look back on that really appreciate it well thank you for creating a safe space Simon I appreciate it and thank you Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please give us a click on the follow button on your chosen podcast platform. We'd also love to hear your views on either future topics or indeed if you've got any thoughts on future guests that we should look to get onto the podcast. Thanks again. See you next time.